I will talk to you about uh, a simple question today. Uh, and the question is, what, what are markets? What are the founding principles, the operating principles of markets? Uh, how do they touch us in our daily lives? And most importantly, how do they work well? Now, with simple questions like that, they are not always easy to answer. And with markets, part of the challenge is they're so much part of our everyday lives that we take their operation for granted. Now that is not specific to markets. Most of us have a mobile phone, and we just assume it operates. We don't have to understand how it works internally. We use computers uh, more widely in our daily lives. We trust that institutions operate the way we expect them to operate. Uh, we expect there's a national health service, for example. The police are somewhere there to, to make sure that, that, that order pertains. And we expect uh, that we can access banks, uh, that we have uh, institutions there that make sure financial intermediation works, which at the moment is taking us into a number of exciting directions, uh, crowdfunding, for, for example. Now, with, with markets, the interesting question of the pervasiveness of markets is virtually everything you do. When you're sitting in here, what you wear, how you got here, that, that would have uh, got you in touch with markets in one sense or another. If you consider education, that links into your expectations of how you will fare in markets. The cars you drive, the houses you buy or rent, and also the people you talk to. You're sitting today here in this event, you, you would have bought a ticket, and, and that would have been a market mechanism as well. So, the curious thing about markets is, mostly we don't see them anymore. A market stall we recognize, and we might buy strawberries here in the region at market stalls, but for the most part, the markets that we engage with uh, are a bit more removed from, from market stalls as we know them. Now, if you go to economists, uh, the profession that, that studies markets in depth and allied professions, uh, financial specialists, maybe they can give us some answers on what markets are, how they operate, and, and most of the concepts and terms that they will use to explain uh, markets, you will be familiar with. Uh, there's supply, there's demand, there are market prices, and somehow supply and demand in markets is balanced against each other so that there's an, if, if there's an increase in demand, then prices are bid up. Uh, if there's an oversupply, then prices are bid down. And we hope and we trust that that works well. And the reason we hope and that we trust that that works well is uh, that there is competition. Markets are institutions uh, that we hope and we trust, actually, channel competition to beneficial effects in society. And economists, since the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, Adam Smith over there in Kikori, um, they, they would talk about that, uh, they've talked about that for 200 years, uh, on the basis of describing markets as an invisible hand that somehow operates to our benefit, while what we are supposed to do in markets, we are to pursue our self-interest. Now, that's the interesting thing about markets. But how does that work? How can it be that if I am egoistical, I look at my self-interest, uh, and by doing so, I benefit us all? Well, let's, let's take an example. Let's take uh, the market for shoes. A shoe manufacturer, we all buy shoes. Now, if we shop around for shoes, obviously, uh, it would be good if we compared price. If to identical pairs, hopefully we should buy the ones that, that are uh, a bit less pricey. For the shoe manufacturer, they have a very strong incentive to produce shoes uh, in the lowest cost way possible. Now here's the interesting bit. Of course, we as consumers, we, we'd like sh shoes to be not very pricey at all. So in that sense, we, we are allied to the interests of the manufacturers. Uh, but, of course, their motivation is not to sell shoes cheaply. They're trying to sell shoes to us at the highest possible price. We would like to see low-cost shoes, but they'd like to sell them very dearly to us. So how is that supposed to work? Well, it's competition. If, if there are more manufacturers around uh, uh, that can undercut the price by still covering the costs, they will go into the market. And in that sense, uh, the price uh, that we buy shoes for, hopefully, if markets work well, uh, reflect the cost of production. 
Now, for that to work well, I mentioned some of the factors already. We as consumers, we have a duty to look after ourselves, our self-interest, trying to, to look for the least costly shoes available that we're interested in, manufacturers, as opposed to, to look at how they organize the manufacturing, the management process. And if that does not work well, well, there might be some remedies. Maybe we talk about financial literacy of the consumer, how they manage their budgets, how they engage with markets. Uh, if shoe manufacturers don't work, uh, in, in that efficient way, maybe we can send them to, to, to management schools so that they uh, learn better how to maximize their profits. But what about those markets themselves? What about competition? What happens if that doesn't work? Well, what happens if shoe manufacturers get together and there's a conspiracy to keep the prices up? Now, if you've followed the news as I have last week, this week, uh, you will have seen Financial Times was all over the media. <laughs> in financial markets, that's exactly, that's exactly what's happening in those banks. That's happening in, in foreign exchange markets. They get together behind our backs in online rooms and they talk about how to, how to manipulate key market indicators, key market prices. So that doesn't seem to work well. And have we looked at all the factors that we need to consider to understand why, in particular, financial markets at the moment are difficult entities in terms of institutions. I'm suggesting, so far, in my story of markets, we have not really touched on a, a very important point. And in order to, to illustrate that point, I invite you on a journey. In fact, I invite you to think back on when you last went on a taxi ride. It's not like buying shoes, but it's uh, contracting a service. So what happens? So you, touch, you flag a taxi down, door opens, you tell the driver where you'd like to go, um, you sit down, you relax, and hopefully the driver gets you to the destination that, that you want to get to. You look around, yeah, that's where I want to be. Right, okay, so now you need to settle uh, the, the taxi fare, you look at the meter, and you tender the, the amount expected, uh, you leave the taxi, and that's it. True, if you go separate ways, you never see each other again. Now, here's an admission to a guilty pleasure of mine. As academics, we tend to travel the world to attend conferences, and typically we have to get from the airport to a hotel, to the conference venue, uh, and sometimes we use taxis. And, and over the last 15 years, uh, I've quite enjoyed talking to taxi drivers uh, about their job. But not just that. I would also ask them, what would you do if I simply got out and did not pay? Now, that gets you into very interesting conversations, <laughs> depending on the country that you find yourselves in. So in Germany, for example, the police is mentioned rather swiftly. The police will get you, of course. Contracts will be enforced. You'll, you'll find yourself in front of a judge or in front of the police. In Italy, they would call their mates. Yeah? So other taxi drivers <laughs> would start looking out for you. They would trust their mates. But in Holland, I was sitting next to a big taxi driver. He just showed me his biceps. <laughs> Maybe I didn't do enough exercise, but I paid up. In Chicago, woman taxi driver, she just very quietly, calmly reached underneath her seat and produced a colt. <laughs> I, I paid there too. <laughs> yeah. But what was, in, what was interesting, I mean, she, she explained me in quite some detail how she's scanning clients and, and how she only engages with clients and only stops, will only be uh, let flag down if they have a trusty appearance. Now, in, in, in the West Midlands, it's very interesting. Um, Taxi drivers overall um, have a higher risk uh, of being subject to crime. And that is on the minds of taxi drivers. And that, that is something that, that has become a political issue in, in, in some regions of, uh, of the UK. And, and of course, imagine my surprise when I first uh, visited London quite, quite a long time ago. And you sit down, you relax, and it goes click, put, left and right, the doors are closed, you can't get out. Uh, so in my discussion with my first London taxi driver, he just explained, look, uh, I, I will simply not lift my foot from the brake because in the, uh, the Hackney uh, cabs, that means that the doors remain shut. 
if you read news articles on that, sometimes there are, there are instances uh, <laughs> where a customer is trapped uh, in a taxi. So, so ask yourself, why would you actually pay when you're on a taxi ride? Because you could simply just run it, leg it. Maybe we went through some of the factors that would probably persuade you to pay. But all those factors could be turned around. What do you do? The taxi driver, after you, gave them 10 pounds, looked at you, and you wanted to get out and said, look, you've got to pay. And he said, no, no, I just gave you 10 pounds. No, 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 where? I don't see the 10 pounds. You haven't paid. If you don't pay, I call the police. We chase you down. We find you. What do you do then? So the point here, the more general point is, that's, that's a daily transaction for a basic service. It relies on an underlying notion of civility that is in place between yourself and the taxi driver. And for the most part, that actually works. Sometimes it does not, but for the most part, it actually works. And it does not work because of regulation, because we've got rules of the game that can be enforced so that everybody who plays the game sticks to those rules, because otherwise they get punished. No, they, they, they relate to those rules because they're, they're rules of basic civility of how we actually engage with each other in civil societies. So when today we talk about problematic dimensions of financial markets. A lot of the discussions over the last four years have been, where has the regulator been? Should we not regulate the markets in better, more efficient ways? Well, of course, that has happened to some extent. Anybody who's followed the discussions can make up their minds to what extent that has been successful in the various geographies that are relevant in global financial markets. But is that, the only, is that the only factor that we need to take into account? And my suggestion is, it is not. All of us have a duty, when we think about financial markets, to not get drawn into that story that they are global, they are anonymous. And those traders, they are there to get the greatest possible financial benefits and bonuses from engaging in those financial markets. No, in our minds, we should not think of financial markets as these anonymous entities. They're similar to markets for services like the taxi ride. They're similar to when we engage in the market for shoes. We understand them much better than we think. And we should not, when we go to the NHS, when we engage with professionals there, where we have a basic trust, the professionals there, that, that they, they live up to certain standards. And you can find that in other professions as well. We should have the same expectations on an individual level with those who engage in financial markets. And not just regard that as a space that is different, that is anonymous, that is driven by, by different rationales. No, it's not. Because markets are a core part of our civil society. And without that underlying civility that we have to expect of each other in this society, including all those who are engaged in the financial system, without that, there's no hope for civil society overall.